Let's everybody take our song books. We're going to turn to page 96. Lord, lead me on. Let's call those who can to stand. Page 96. bunch that's gone to Florida were, uh, were uh, texting me that this afternoon and telling me what a blessing it was. They'd watched it on YouTube. And uh, I was going to tell one of them uh, since they had left, we had such good service, but I thought better. I probably not should say that. <laughs> They'll probably see tonight's. And uh, what the Lord does is, is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And uh, just a glorious, glorious time. And I want to take this opportunity because the last couple of weeks I have stressed, I know in this service, I believe in the morning service and even in, in one of the uh, nights where we uh, were teaching about how if we as God's people would just get ourselves where we need to be as close to God as we possibly can and come in this place, and many of you did that this morning, and I want to commend you for that. Because we, you can't have a service like that and God move in such a powerful way without somebody getting close to Jesus through the week. And so um, that's you folks. And uh, I, I'm just proud to, to be able to tell you that in, in, in a loving way. I appreciate you so much. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. and and. Uh, if you've got somebody on your heart that's lost, call their name out to God tonight. Would you do that? Somebody that's maybe drifted a little bit, call their name out to the Lord tonight. God hears and answers prayer. Precious Father in heaven, thank you. Lord, we give you such honor and glory for what you did in our midst this morning. The lives that were touched and no doubt, Lord, the conviction that went to lost souls today. And even, even those that didn't make a visible uh, move this morning towards you, maybe didn't come to the altar, 
but I could see people rejoicing all over the house and we thank you for that and I thank you for a people Lord that love you so much that have just kind of this past week have just crawled up into your lap and got as close as they could and, and I appreciate that and I pray your blessings on them this week uh, for being obedient to you and may Lord you direct us tonight I don't know what you have in store for us but Lord help us to be receptive to your spirit and lead us guide us and direct us and we will forever be thankful for that I pray you'd watch over Pastor Tony tonight Lord you just heal him and in a way that you see fit and others that need the touch of the master tonight in Jesus name amen for those of you that may not know Pastor Tony had some surgery Wednesday as a result of the previous surgery he had and uh, he asked me last night to tell you uh, thank you for your prayers and interceding on his behalf you may be seated Let's turn to page 276. I heard this song two weeks ago at a Baptist church in Mississippi. It's funny, it's set up just like our church. It's a little smaller, but it's set up, and they use the same books. And I'll tell you what, those folks sing. They always want me to play the piano. I always tell them, let me stop playing the piano. You guys just sing, because they are so good. Uh, this is one of the songs they did, and Marty just pulled it up. He wasn't there. Let me start tonight by asking you a question. Um, what
what will you be doing 150 years from now? That's a pretty different question, isn't it? I don't suspect any of us would be sitting here like we are tonight, obviously. Um, but I wonder if we would take an inventory of our life. I, I sort of drifted off to sleep this afternoon, and I'm not liking this 5 o'clock stuff because it cuts right in the middle of my nap. But... Uh, uh, nonetheless, this week I have looked at Scripture, I've studied, I've put that aside, studied something else. Then it seems like I'd be drawn over to this and I'd go over here and I'd read a little bit and I couldn't quite, I don't know how to explain to you how us preachers kind of zero in on what we think the Lord wants. But I wasn't zeroing in this week. And uh, so then yesterday, this scripture came back to my mind. And I started reading a little bit on that and studying out. And I got up 6 o'clock this morning and went to my computer and looked at some stuff that pertained to this. And I still just, I just couldn't get real satisfied with it. And uh, obviously that was because it wasn't meant to be preached this morning. God had different things in store. And as I, I came with something over here, but I, I'm not satisfied really with that. And this is really all that's on my heart. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you is this. Whenever a preacher preaches on what I'm about to preach on tonight, it's, it's a salvation message usually. And as I look across this house, best I can tell, it, it, at least those that are accountable, uh, we're all saved. And so, I, but I learned a long time ago, I've seen on several occasions in my preaching and in revivals that I've preached, you might preach what you think is a message to lost people and, and the church get revived. Or you preach something to the church and lost people get saved. So I've learned not to question the Lord, but it's a little uncomfortable sometimes when you, uh, for me to discern, is this me or is this the Lord? So if I were to say to you, Genesis chapter 6, what would you say back to me? What's the topic there? Bef without looking in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 6. I'm sorry? I didn't hear what you said. She's having second thoughts. How about Noah's Ark? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. When you found that, if you're able, let's stand. And uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit in my reading and maybe keep your Bibles open after we're done. I have no idea why such a message would be preached to this type of congregation tonight, but... Uh, I'm just going to try my best to follow what I believe is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. In verse 8 of Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Down to verse 12. I'm sorry, let's go to 11. And the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, Rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it, or make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, 
and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shall be set in the side thereof with lower second and third stories, thou shalt make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. Chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Now let's jump down to verse 12. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Verse 16. And they went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And then now go with me down to <clears throat> verse 4 of chapter 8. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. That's enough. You may be seated. Keep your Bibles open, if you would. Let me read that last verse that I read in our hearing one more time. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, that's where I want to get, but I want to go back and pick us up and take us there, uh, if I may. According to what most people believe, Noah was a man of righteousness and God had used him to deliver a message to the people of his day. And that message was that God was going to send rain on the earth. Prior to chapter 6, uh, rain has been unheard of. The people don't understand what rain is because it's never rained before. If you read earlier in the Genesis account, you'll find that when God desired to water the earth, he did it by bringing up a dew out of the earth. And the dew watered that earth. But now God has looked at man, and of course in chapter 3, uh, we find the fall of man. We find man has disobeyed God. God said in the garden, of all the trees of this garden, you can freely eat. But then he puts a restriction on them and he says, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in the day that you eat thereof. God didn't say if you eat thereof, because God has foreknowledge and God knew what they'd do. God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Well, you remember the story, how they disobey God and they ate and many people even today would refute what God said because they would say well they didn't die immediately and that's true they didn't die a physical death immediately but they died a spiritual death a death that separated them from God and as soon as that separation took place you find prior to that that Adam and Eve are in fellowship with the Lord and they are walking in the midst of the garden. But after they have disobeyed God, you find them hiding in that garden. And God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he calls out and he says, Adam, where are you? Now, God wasn't looking for Adam, nor was he looking for information about Adam. God knew just exactly where Adam was, as he knows where you and I are. And what he was wanting Adam to recognize was where Adam was, because Adam was hiding. And not only was Adam hiding, but prior to this, the Bible said that the man and the woman were naked and not ashamed. But now they have sown fig leaves and they have uh, covered themselves because of their shame. Now we all understand that fig leaves are a temporary covering. They're not going to last. But in this, it grieved God that he had made man. Now, I don't have answers for you about that. 
Because if God has foreknowledge and God knew everything and God knew that they were going to fall, then why was God grieved? And I've been asked that question and I don't have an answer. Uh, if you might have one, I'd appreciate you sharing it with me sometime. But here man has fallen and now we come into chapter 6 and God says because of that fall, they're going to be judgment upon the earth. And I'm going to send a rain that is going to be such a deluge and such a powerful rain that this is going to destroy the whole earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Aren't you glad one day that you found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Aren't you glad that we were like Noah? Uh, we were rebellion. Uh, we were people that had disobeyed, and yet God in all of his infinite mercy and wisdom and particularly his grace. And grace has been defined a number of ways. It's God's unmerited, that means you can't earn it, undeserved, freely given to favor. Uh, some people define it as God's riches at Christ's expense. However you define grace, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God says to Noah, now you're going to build an ark. And anyone who steps inside of that ark when it's ready to sail is going to be saved from this rain that's coming. So Noah, uh, I suspect, with one hand is building and with the other hand he's preaching. And he's preaching, as, as I understand it, for about 120 years and he hasn't got one convert. Now, if he would have been a Baptist preacher, he'd have got discouraged and he would have probably quit long long before the 120 years. But could you imagine every single day Noah saying this to the people? There's going to come rain. Remember now, they don't know what rain is. They've never heard of rain before. But it's going to rain, and it's going to rain so hard that everything that you see out here is going to be destroyed. And the only way to save yourselves and to save your family is to get into this vessel that God has instructed me to build. And he preaches day after day after day to these folks. And as he's preaching this, uh, they're laughing at him, no doubt. They're scorning him. They're ridiculing him, making fun of him because they've never heard of rain before. And this must be a madman. This must be a man who, who has lost his wits. Uh, he's telling us about something that has never been known before. He's building a, a vessel that he says is going to ride on water. Now, uh, uh, they didn't know what water was at the time, I suppose. Now, there may have been water on the earth, according to the Genesis account, but they've never seen it come out of heaven. And so as they're doing all of this, the Bible said that God said to, to Noah, make an ark and make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. And it's going to have three stories to it. Now, let me pause for a moment here. And the reason I suspect that I'm preaching this to you is to help us get an understanding that in the Old Testament, a lot of people look at the Old Testament and they, they get uncomfortable there. They don't understand things there. But let me tell you what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is kind of like a hindsight on a rifle. If you're going to shoot a rifle, you've got two sights on it. You've got one that's nearer to your eye, and you've got another that's out there on the end, and you line up those two sights, and then you try to hit your target. Now, the one that's out there on the end of the barrel, to me, is the New Testament. But you can't line up the New Testament unless you line up the Old Testament. So what is the Old Testament all about? It's one continuous story that's incomplete when you get to Malachi. And then after a four-year silence, God begins to complete his story in the New Testament. So what, why do, does God give us these events, these people, um, all of these structures that we see in the Old Testament? Every single solitary one of them points to Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they are signs and symbols. They are 
a typology, if you will, is one word that's used. They are a type of Christ. So let me give you an example. Moses is a deliverer to bring the children out of Egyptian bondage. He's a type of Jesus. If you looked at the tabernacle in the wilderness, every single article of furniture represents something about Jesus. For instance, the lampstand that stands in the holy place speaks of the light, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light. But then he dies, he's resurrected, he goes back to the Father, and now he says, you're the light of the world. So we see in Moses a type of Christ. We see in the lampstand a type of Christ. And we see events back here in the Bible that are pointing us toward Jesus just as this ark is because this ark is Jesus. It's not a boat that floats. Now, uh, I'm not telling you that, that, that it wasn't, that it didn't exist, because it did. But as we point ourselves toward that, there's some things that we need to understand. And one of those things is that Jesus, or the Lord said to, to Noah, pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, the way that we might understand that today is we might say, let's tar it. Let's put something on the inside because when they put boards together to make this ark of gopher wood, when one board ended here, the other board obviously, just like today, it doesn't go right up against it and become flush with it. There's a gap in there somewhere. Sometimes it's closer to this. Sometimes there's more of a gap to this. So there needed to be something that could go between those boards that would cause this ark to float and not sink, to not take on too much water. And that's what the pitch was. They were to take this pitch and go along all the seams and put it on the inside and put it on the outside. So I'm going to preach to you and I tonight that Jesus is the ark and the Holy Spirit is the pitch. He's that that keeps the ark afloat. He's that that keeps you and I going. He is that that causes you and I to rejoice like we rejoice this morning. He is that that causes what God has brought into our midst to satisfy you and I and to be a vessel that God can use. And then he goes on to say, now if you look at that word pitch, if you study it out in the original Hebrew language, it will take you to the word atonement. Now atonement, if you break that word down, you can break it down at one minute. Atonement, remember the day of atonement. Back in the wilderness wanderings, when Israel was in the wilderness eating manna, drinking water from a rock, and they were taking a spiritual hike because of their disobedience, not wanting to go into the promised land. So think about this. As they're in there, the scripture tells us that uh, God took Moses to the top of Mount Sinai. He gave him the Ten Commandments. He also gave him the pattern of the tabernacle. And he told them after that tabernacle was all established, he said one time every year, the high priest, the main priest of it all, was to take blood at the entranceway of the tabernacle, just inside the tent. He was to kill an animal, a lamb. He was to take that blood. He was to make a, a uh, pathway behind this big curtain that was up here and put the blood on the top of the ark called the mercy seat. And he did that one time every year. Now, this is not in the Bible this way, but uh, I've read about this as being custom, and, and it relates a little bit to what we experienced this morning. It's said that the high priest, because when he went behind that veil, that big curtain that was probably at least four inches thick. It had no seam to it and couldn't be torn. When he went behind there, the people would get nervous and they would get 
uh, afraid because if something were to happen to him, they weren't allowed to go back there. And so they needed to know, is he okay? So custom now, not Bible, but custom says that they tied a rope around his ankle. And as he went in to offer that sacrifice, as he was moving back there, every time he would move, the rope would give a little tug on this end and they would realize that he's still alive. He's still doing all right. Uh, I somehow liken that to me. Sometimes in my life, I want to know, Lord, are you still there? Seem like I can't get a, a good nudge. It seemed like I need something more than, than what I seem to be getting. And every once in a while, when I get a hold of the prayer bells of heaven, like we sang about this morning, and I pull just a little bit in my heart, it seems like on the other end, I can feel a tug that says, I'm okay. I'm still here. I'm still on the throne. Aren't you glad you got a God that's still on the throne? Aren't you glad you got a God that, that knows everything about you? And so when when uh, the Day of Atonement came, atonement means covering of the sin. So now in the New Testament, you don't find that atonement. You find that that sin is washed away in the blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad of that? Doesn't it excite you just a little bit to know that Jesus said, when I forgive your sin, I will cast it into the sea of forgetfulness never to be remembered against you again. Isn't that precious? Now listen, does that mean Jesus has Alzheimer's? Does that mean that the Lord has dementia? Does that mean he's incapable of remembering? That's not at all what it means. What it means is when God forgives it, he never brings it up against you again. Now for all of us that are here tonight that are married... But that may not be the case all the time. Sometimes when, when a husband or a wife have a, an intense moment of fellowship, one with the other, and uh, they think everything's kind of made up and everything's okay, two weeks down the road when something else causes another intense moment of fellowship, uh, one reminds the other of the previous moment of intense fellowship. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do any of that sort of stuff. God says, when I forgive it, I hold it against you no longer. That's what forgiveness in the New Testament way means. So he said to take it and put pitch in it. And then look what he said. He said, put a window in the ark and the window. Now, if you were going to put a window in this building, look where we put the window. We put it on the side so we could see out. If we would have put the window up there, the only thing we could have seen was the sky. Why do you think God had him put a window up there? Because God wanted his people just like he does today. He wants us to keep focused on him. He doesn't want us focused on the things out here that trouble us so much. He wants us focused on himself. And then he said, there's going to be one door to this ark and that door is going to be in the side of the ark. I would remind you that on the cross of Calvary, when Jesus shed his blood for our forgiveness, the Bible said when he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, there was a centurion soldier that came with a spear in his hand. Now, mind you, Jesus has released his spirit already, and in our vocabulary, his body is dead. This uh, soldier takes a spear and thrusts it where? He thrusts it into the side of Jesus. And forthwith, the King James said, came there out blood and water. I believe that when God took Adam and he had formed him out of the dust of the earth and he had breathed into his nostrils and made a living soul, he saw that it was not good that Adam be alone. So he makes a helpmeet for Adam. And the way that he did so was to open the side of Adam and take a rib out of his side. And with that rib, he made woman or he made Eve to be a helpmeet or one that would stand by Adam. And so he caused a deep sleep to come on Adam. 
He performed that surgery, if you will, in his side and took the rib out. On Calvary, a deep sleep came on Jesus called death. And there at Calvary, that centurion soldier, not realizing that he was following the will and the command of God, thrust that spear into his side, blood and water come out, and I personally believe that that was the church coming out of the side of Christ. And as you look at the scripture, you'll find that you can go back to Noah's ark and find that the door was in the side of the ark. Jesus is the only door to salvation. Amen? Now, it's been speculated this past week that one of my characters that I pick on a lot may run for president. Now, I'm not going to get political with you. Um, Oprah's who I'm talking about, in case you missed it. Uh, they're, they're touting that Oprah's going to run for president, and she may, and that's up to her. But remember I've told you the story about her having uh, some religious leaders on her program one time, as they went through this program, they were talking about what this religion believes on how you can get to heaven, what this one believes on how you can get to heaven, and so on. And then she summarized at the end of the program, and here was basically her summary. She said, all of these different religions tell us about a different way to God. And her summary was, we're all going to God, but we're going a different way. That's extremely contrary to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the door. And by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall find pasture in there. And so the Lord says, and, and you can't argue with the Lord. You can't argue with the scripture. I don't try to do so. So what he was really saying when he told Noah, put a door in the side of the ark and just put one door. It's an entrance door. And when Noah put it in and Noah's preached for 120 years and nobody has listened to him. Now I want you to put yourself in the, in the shoes of those people that have at least listened to Noah one time. And you're standing there one day and you see this door that's open and you see probably a plank that's come out from the door to the ground, and you see Noah taking animals two by two and put him on the inside. Now, it's not lined out like this in the scripture, but Noah had some sons, some daughter-in-laws, and a wife. And he puts them on. Total counting Noah was eight souls that went on that ark. When Noah got his family on the ark, this is just me now. Can you imagine if you were standing nearby and you had heard that message over and over and over again, that there's going to come a rain that's going to destroy the earth. And all of a sudden, you feel a wet drop on your cheek. One drop. Now two. Now three. And you look up. And you see this water coming from heaven. Something that had never been realized before. And then it gets a little harder. You've been in a rain that starts out real gentle and then picks up in intensity. And here it comes faster and faster and harder and harder. And I believe at the very last moment, Noah is still preaching, get inside the ark. The door is still open. Get in the ark. Let me take you to the New Testament. You remember the story about the 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish? The Bible said that uh, they all slumbered and slept. But when at midnight there came a cry out, the bridegroom's coming. And they all jump up, and those that had oil in their lamp, representing the Spirit, they went in. But those that did not have the oil, they wanted to take the oil from the others. And they said, you, we just got enough for ourselves. You go get it. You go buy it for yourself. Now, as they went, the Bible said that God, the five that were prepared went in and God shut the door. You can read here in this account that when Noah got on the ark, God shut him in. 
Now, when God shut him in, here's what that means. Nobody else can get in because the door has shut. There's going to come a day when those people that you and I work with every day, we recreate with every day, family of ours, there's going to come a day that there's no more opportunity for them. So I would say to you and I, we need more of what we had here this morning. We need more people like you folks that love the Lord and are trying their very dead level best to be all that God wants them to be because there needs to be something that people see and can recognize and say there's something to this thing called Christianity. These folks need to be saved. But when the door shuts, that's it, folks. You'll never find anywhere in here the door opens again. When God shuts the door, Noah didn't shut the door. Noah just directed them to the door. That's my job and your job is to direct them to Jesus. He said, I am the door. And when we are directing our loss to Jesus, there's still opportunity for them to get in. Now, people don't believe today. And God said, I'm not going to destroy this world by water anymore, but it will get destroyed one day. Uh, it'll get purified by fire. And so then he said to Noah, with you, I'll establish my covenant. So he said, come thou and all thy house into the ark. What a great invitation. Come. Come. You remember the invitation that Jesus gave Peter on the water? He just simply said, come. Peter got out of the boat. The wind was boisterous. Peter said, if that's really you, bid me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. And Peter walked on water. There's a great invitation today, folks. And that invitation has come to Jesus. That invitation uh, really means that God will use you and I to reach into the heart. There were folks that sat here this morning. And I try my best a lot of times when a service like that's going, or any service for that matter, I try not to focus in one direction too much because I don't want people thinking that I'm looking at them or pointing them out in any way. But there were people here this morning that have said to me, I'm not yet saved. I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. And when something, when the Holy Spirit moves like he did today, I'm thinking, how in the world could somebody not just turn to Christ? How in the world could somebody delay that? But that's not for you and I to figure out. It's for you and I to keep preaching as Noah did for 120 years, preaching the same message over and over and over again. You preached a message. You that are in this choir, you preached a message. In fact, Mike said to me this morning, coming out of the choir, when church was over today, he said something to the effect, wasn't it good that we could preach for you this morning? And I'd never heard it put quite that way, but that's exactly what this choir did. Preach means proclaim, and you proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ. And you not only proclaimed him with your good voices, but throughout this week, as you got closer and closer and closer to Jesus, as you prayed and as you asked the Lord to speak to hearts, when you got up here this morning, that was just a culmination of all of the week before. And thank the Lord that it's like that. And lives got touched. And lives got changed. And I promise you this, there were folks that left here that I am satisfied with my heart that the Holy Spirit said to them, I want to save you this morning. I want to be yours this morning. Now, uh, we can't save them. We can't make them get saved. But all we can do is do exactly what we did today. It, and it wasn't just a choir. It was the congregation. People had, had come in here, fessed up, filled up, fed up with the devil, and, and just perked up and desiring to see something happen from the Lord. And from almost the, maybe even the very first note, in fact, even when Tom started to introduce the first song, it seemed like such a sweet spirit began to move in our midst. And so in the middle of all of this, there's an invitation, come, come. Jesus calling, come. 
And so let me conclude with this. In verse 17 of chapter 7, it said, The flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. Let me remind you of, of something Jesus said. He said, If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And that's exactly what happened here this morning. Jesus got lifted up. Jesus got lifted up higher than ourselves. He got lifted up in his glory. And as he got lifted up, the Holy Spirit sent the invitation out to come. Now I want to leave you with this. If your Bibles are still open, in the fourth verse of chapter 8, you read this, these words. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. In my studies, here's what I have learned. And I, it would take me too long and I'd have to brush up on trying to help you understand. But this seventh month is the month Abib, A-B-I-B. -B. And the 17th of Abib, there's two other wonderful things that happened in the scripture. One of those on the 17th of Abib, when the mountains of Ararat, the ark rested. In other words, it came to rest on those mountains because the flood was receding. On the 17th of Abib is the day that God in his wonderful, infinite power had Moses hold his staff out over the Red Sea and God parted that sea and they walked through on dry ground. Isn't it amazing what the Bible teaches us? And then, on the 17th day of Abib, a body, the body that had hung on an old rugged cross and was taken down and wrapped and placed in a borrowed tomb on the 17th of Abib was the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't tell me that God doesn't weave it all the way through the scriptures. God weaves a message. You know what God is saying to us? God is saying, get in this ark. This ark is Jesus. And this ark will save you. And it comes to rest. That means he's done all of his work. When he said on the cross, it's finished. Satan must have saw. And Satan must have said, you're right. It's finished. But that's not at all what Jesus meant. Jesus meant, I've done, Father, what you sent me to do. I've done everything to present you to them. And now I have given the ultimate sacrifice. And as I release my spirit to you, and my body goes to this grave, it'll only stay there for three days. And on the 17th day of the month of Abib, Jesus Christ got out of the grave. And that's symbolic of the sea of the red parting its ways and the children of Israel leaving Egyptian bondage. You and I were in bondage one day. But praise God, he parted that. But he really parted it when Jesus got up from the grave. Isn't that wonderful? Boy, if that don't excite you, you ought to get saved. It's a good thing. Stand with me this morning or this evening. What a precious God. Here's how I'd like for us to close out. If there's somebody on your heart that's not saved yet, if there's somebody on your heart that doesn't yet uh, know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, if there's somebody on your heart that needs a closer walk with the Lord, and there's somebody that's going through whatever on your heart, and you'd like to come and close out in prayer, you come on their behalf. You don't have to mention their name. I've got a God that knows exactly the first step you make. He'll know exactly who you're coming for. If you'd like to come tonight, I'm going to close in prayer. And you come and represent somebody that needs Jesus. If you'll do that, let's trust that the Lord will move in their heart and save their ever-dying soul.
You just pray as the Lord moves on your heart to pray. Oh, I'm so satisfied that God's going to use you people to reach lost souls. I believe that this morning was just a beginning. I believe the Lord's going to move in a great and a powerful way. And I believe that at some point in time, that person that you're praying for right this moment, whether it's in this building or elsewhere, I believe those folks are come to faith in Christ. If you'll believe that with me, we're two or three together in his name. He said, I'll be in the midst of that. We use that for a small congregation sometimes. I don't think that's what really he meant by it. If we'll just agree with one another, if we'll just come together with one another, our God is an awesome God. Our God is a great God, and our God can do all things. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You pray. finished praying, if you'll just stand to your feet. Don't stand if you're not finished, but when you're finished, you just stand to your feet. A lot of definitions of faith. I read one a couple weeks ago. Faith's believing what you can't see. And there's people's lives that come here every Sunday that I just can't see how in the world it's going to work out for them. But I'm glad I'm not God. I'm glad God's God, aren't you? And I'm glad that God can see beyond what I'm capable of seeing. Tom, would you get us a song? And let's do this before we leave. Just shake hands with somebody. And when you're shaking hands with somebody, let that be a gesture that says, would you pray for my person that I'm praying for, persons? Would you pray with me that God would intercede? Because I believe, I truly believe that we're on the verge of a breakout of folks getting saved by the marvelous grace of God. And boy, when that happens, couldn't anything been any better than this morning than somebody got saved? Would you agree with that? That's the kind of God we serve. So we're going to come to this mission. Don't forget you got choir afterward. Let's begin choir right now. Just singing together and trusting the Lord. Reach around, shake hands with somebody. There is a name.
God bless you. Don't forget tomorrow night, for those of you that are in the Nehemiah study, uh, we'll be in classroom one tomorrow night. And then on Wednesday night, we'll be back here. Awana Wednesday night. New class starting for college age and career age, so put the word out for that in Sunday school at 945. God bless you. May the Lord's blessing shine upon you. Prayer meeting at 730. Pardon me? Prayer meeting at 730 Wednesday night. How about 630? I'm 630. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wants you.